delightful, and oh, so soothing. It's Sacramento Smooth Jazz. Welcome back to Sacramento Smooth Jazz. I'm your host, Michael Andrews, and today I am thrilled to welcome back the legendary sax icon, Dean James. Dean James will be treating us to some of his incredible tunes here in this segment. And if you've ever had the opportunity to see him play, you know that many describe his sound as not just sultry, but soulful, funky. He's really, really amazing. Dean James, he hails right here from Northern California, just a little ways down from us on Highway 80 into the Bay Area in San Francisco. And I know a lot, number of you San Franciscans always want to know when someone's from the city, what high school they went to. Well, we'll talk about that, okay? With multiple chart-topping hits and collaborations with jazz greats, Dean has truly solidified his place as a modern jazz icon, channeling the greats like Parker and Davis into a distinctive style. Dean infuses raw feeling into every silky smooth performance. Just amazing devotees and newcomers alike. Today, this influential innovator remains at the forefront of the smooth jazz scene. Dean James, welcome back to Sacramento Smooth Jazz, man. How are you today? Hey, Michael. I'm good, man. I, I appreciate the invite and, and uh, good to hear your voice again and, and happy holidays to you. Hey, hey, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, man. Always a pleasure speaking with you, man. We talk a couple times throughout the year. It's always great to just, you know, have our conversations. And uh, right now, you're you're out of Texas right now, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm based out of Houston. I guess you can call me Houstonian, man. I've been here 20 years now. So what made you head on to, uh, to Texas? What was going on there? Well, a lot of folks don't know this, but I actually lived in L.A. 13 years after I left the Bay Area. And then I moved to Atlanta, Georgia. I was signed to a record label back in 1995. From that point, I uh, was approached by the folks from the Universal Circus. Wow, really? <laughs> Casual Cal and company. And they approached me and, and asked if I'd go on tour for three years, 10 months out of the, the year, I would be on the road with the Soul Circus. I think back in 2001, I uh, they added Houston, Texas, to the, the calendar, the tour schedule, and um, man, I fell in love with Houston, and I ended up moving from Atlanta, Georgia to Houston, and I've been here ever since then. You know, I can see why you would fall in love with Houston. Now, I've been there a number of times on business, and I have family there, and I tell you, it's a wonderful place. I learned real quickly, even though you could drive 45 minutes, you could still stay in Houston. <laughs> Oh, of course. You you know what? You could be driving 13 hours and still haven't passed El Paso, Texas. <laughs> My gosh. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. The only thing I haven't gotten used to is the uh, the weather. You know, I'm, I'm a San Franciscan, so yeah, it's been, right, it's right. been a little tough. <laughs> <laughs> I totally understand that. Now, you mentioned back in 1995, uh, your first album, Can We Talk? Which is ironic because I enjoy your cover on that, Can We Talk? You know what? I won an award for that cover. <laughs> Did you? Wow. Okay. And of course, back then, I, you know, uh, I don't know if a lot of these youngsters know about it, but you remember Blockbuster Video. Oh, yeah. They would host these contests every year and they would include the independent labels and the major labels. And I won an award for the best album cover of that year through Blockbuster. That was an interesting deal there. Yeah, a, a lot of folks still talk about that CD, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And something that I listen to on occasion, because I'm telling you, it's going back to 95. It's like, listen, good music is timeless. We know this. And that there, I, I can see your energy. I can hear you and feel your energy going back then. But then also you follow that up with Intimacy, which was another really good album. So you've done some great things on this. And then, listen, one of the things on which I enjoy from now I'm progressing and since we're talking about albums you know, your love takes time out back in 09. Right. Another cover, Thing Your Man Won't Do. Your cover on that is real nice. It's re very nice on that one. So what was your inspiration with respect to that cover? Because I think people need to listen to that one. Thing Your Man Won't Do. There's a, it's a long story behind that. I'll have to share that with you uh -oh, on another uh -oh. interview. That was the first project that I produced myself. Again, majority of that project outside of uh, all the things your man won't do. There was another cover that I had on there, which did really well on, on radio, which is the, the tune that was recorded by Luther Vandross back in the year 2000, written by John Smith, Harold Lilly, and produced by Warren Campbell. Um, Take You Out. Yes. Yeah, I love that song. Yes. Once I was hooked once I saw the video, when the video came out, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do this tune. 
But the tune by Joe, I listened to his music quite a bit. I had somewhat of an R&B background. I played behind a lot of R&B artists uh, while living in Los Angeles. Mm. And so I, you know, I, I would connect with that genre. And before I started playing the sax, I, I was actually singing. And when I was with Vesta Williams, uh, the late Vesta Williams, I had gotten a phone call from her musical director to see I, if I'd be able to, to go on the congratulations tour. That was like her number one hit. Yeah. I went on the road with her, but before the second phone call I received from the musical director is, can you sing? So I had to audition. I ended up being the third background singer on top of that. I got a third phone call saying, can you play keys? I ended up being the secondary keyboard player for Vesta. I had all these, I wore all these hats, played the sax because she, she had an 18 song set and maybe nine or 10 of the songs required saxophone. So I ended up playing secondary keys, ended up singing background vocals. And I got a fourth phone call saying, can you dance? No, I said, no. <laughs> Couldn't do it. Right. So the other two background singers were, were doing the choreography, all the dance steps and all that. Yeah, I had to bow out of that one. But uh, I did the Joe tune going back to Love Takes Time. I ended up, again, I fell in love with the melodic structure. I love what he was going with, with the melody lines. And I actually did it on a dare because a friend of mine told me that I need to learn that song because I, at the same time I, there was another artist that had a song that was in the same identical key and Kim as a matter of fact had a song in the same key so I already knew that song and I played that but the Joe tune was more challenging so yet yeah, it was on a dare and I learned the song and like I said I used to sing before I picked up the sax and so I had an ear for picking up you know melody lines Later on down the road, you know, as you get older, you know, you, you start to slow down and, and all of a sudden I'm just struggling a little bit with learning melody lines. But yeah, I fell in love with that song. I learned it. You know, I used to play it on stage uh, on several occasions when someone would call the song, and, but I didn't know his nuances. And, and the thing about doing cover tunes, too, it's kind of like you at least got to learn the melody line before you deviate from it. You know, especially if you're a jazz artist, you want to know exactly what the artist is doing and before you start improvising, you know, or before you add anything else to that to give it that richness. But that's how that song came about i think uh, and then of course the take you out tonight the luther vandross and there was another song that i recorded which was written by kate bush and it was later recorded by maxwell a few years later and maxwell's version ended up on the love and basketball soundtrack i fell in love with that song and so i recorded my rendition of it and so those were the three covers on that project but all in all i i was pleased with the production work on it you you know, I just happened to stumble on the right studio and the mixes were perfect. And that's the history behind that. Well, that's a really good history. And we'll get into your latest as well. But if you just tuned in, I'm speaking with saxophonist Dean James. He's from the Bay Area originally, now residing there in Houston, Texas. Now, I know my San Franciscans are, are just wanting to know because they, they all they all want to know. If you're from San Francisco, they want to they have one question. What high school did you go to? Well, I went to, well, back then it was Sacred Heart High School, and it's literally cat a corner from St. Mary's Cathedral or Cathedral's High School. This I was at Sacred Heart well before they made it co-ed, so that's why it is now called, I believe it's Sacred Heart College Preparatory. That's what it's called now. That was there, yeah. Got it, got it. Now, being from the Bay Area, what were your earliest musical mentors coming up from the Bay? Do you have any? I did. As a matter of fact, my uncle, who was only five years older than me, he had a vast LP collection. So my first experience with jazz was Herbie Hancock and the Headhunters, you know, from that to Santana to he listened to a lot of Azar Lawrence. I know listened to a lot of Ronnie Laws. He had Grover Washington Jr. He had Sanborn. Pretty much introduced me to that style of music. And I just kind of stuck with it, you know, even before I picked up the sax. You mentioned how you're getting into vocals, you know, and, and you're not known to be a vocalist on your tracks overall. So no. any reason why you kind of stepped away from that or are you not including that a whole lot into your arrangements? 
You know what? Everyone has asked me, you know, when are you going to step out and do vocals? And I'm considering it. I only stepped away from it only because I, I was, I think I was more concerned about trying to learn how to play the sax and, and behind the theory and, and all that. And when I picked up the sax, I had no clue what I was doing. And until now, you know, when, when the theory evolved, it all made sense. Now that you're you know, really focusing in on you know, your composition, your arrangement and producing, of those three, is there any particular one that you enjoy the most? Arrangement, composing, producing, because you seem to do it all. I love writing. Well, when I lived in Atlanta, moved out there in 98, I was busy. I was paying all these writers and producers to put something together for me musically. Whenever I get the, the final results, it's kind of like, man, there's got to be another way. So I ended up getting my own personal workstation and I wrote my very first song in, back in 98. I ended up writing, producing it myself, and it's exactly how I wanted it done. So from that point on, I, it's like, OK, I'm, I'm going to do this on my own, whatever it takes to get it done, you know. And as I mentioned earlier was behind the keyboard and I finally created an ending to a song that I was excited about finishing and it just came naturally. So, you know, my, my love for composing and, and writing, man, I can sit behind the keyboard all day and, and just record all these ideas. And now to a point where it's kind of like, okay, let me sit with this one idea and break it down and see what I can create out of it. That's the best part of writing. Our listeners, many of them have seen you perform. For those who haven't, Dean James is energetic. He's funky. He gets into it. There's some, you can feel it. I want to know, Dean. I've seen you perform live. Listen, whenever we talk, it's just a calm conversation. Hey, how you doing? Oh, man, you just lay back, chill. You get on stage, it's like, well, who's this guy? He just totally transforms. <laughs> He's a different dude. And I'm enjoying it. So what do you pull that emotion from? It's really amazing. Well, the way I look at it from the beginning, it's a God-given talent, man, you know, and, and I finally found it. And well, my, my uncle was responsible too, because he listened to records from The Temptations, Aretha Franklin, The Persuaders, Bloodstone. So I grew up listening to all that. Actually, before I got into the R&B circuit, I wasn't on the gospel circuit. I went to a church by the name of Prayer Garden in San Jose, California. That's where I was. Uh, I'm a born again Christian, so I, that's where I was baptized. So they had this musical and I got a chance to experience Daryl Coley, the Clark sisters. Man, just some iconic gospel artists, you know. And so when they heard me play with the choir, Danny Bell Hall, who had written a song called Ordinary People, she was on tour and she just happened to be in the audience. And her manager approached me after, after this musical and asked if I would play behind Danny Bell. So with Danny Bell Hall, she's like the gospel Roberta Flack. <laughs> so she reminds me of the gospel version of Roberta Flack. And as I traveled with her, she had introduced me to Edwin and Walter Hawkins, Sandra, Andre Crouch, quite a few others, uh, Leon Patillo, a lot of the iconic gospel artists. So I was tied into that. And of course, Daryl Coley had heard me play. I ended up performing with him around town, around Los Angeles. And whenever he'd travel, he'd bring me along with him. So I, I got a chance to experience that side of it. And, and it kind of motivated my playing and inspired my playing and, and before I even committed to, you know, the secular scene, you know. Daryl Coley, man, absolutely, one of my favorites. I still listen. I have him on my playlist. Just absolutely missed. So, yeah, yeah, you have some really amazing influences in your past that really shaped the way. Oh, yeah. Feel, so I yeah. can see why there's passion in what you're doing. Now, your latest project, Groovy Sax, is really something. You got some really nice tracks on there. You open up really nice with the DJ's groove. And I love the transition into It's All Good. Give us a little bit. You know, what was the motivating factor between Groovy Sax? Because this seemed to be some time between Love Takes Time and Groovy Sax. So, you had some time there to really just put some things down and, you know, maybe kind of maybe your experience is kind of the forefront of this particular album. Am I right on this or what's going on? Yeah, well, Groovy Sax was an idea for three years because I know I was sitting on It's All Good for a few years. I don't know what the method to my madness is, but what, what I do is what one day I'll, I'll I have an idea in my head or if I'm driving or if I'm grocery shopping or something, I just have this idea in my head. I'll run home and record it. So at least record the idea 
and record a melody line with it. But for me, lately, it's been, let me record the music that I hear in my head, and then I'll come back to it, turn around and try to create a song form. And then all of a sudden, once I created the song form, then I'll try to create a melody from that point on. And then, then I'll piece the song together. And of course, you know, add the textures and the richness to the song. Once I'm done, it's all good. Groovy sax. This is weird, but groovy sax, since love takes time, I've got to share that experience with you. Something happened with the the Love Takes Time project that I created the title Groovy Sax a month after they released Love Takes Time. So Groovy Sax itself was in the making for X amount of years before I even came up with the music for it. So I just kind of like hung on to the title, you know. I see. It's really, really nice. I always encourage people to, if they're going to go to the various outlets to buy tracks, you know, your iTunes, your Amazon, wherever, you know, I encourage people to get the whole album because it takes you on a journey. Yeah. Hearing one or two, you hear only part of the journey. And so I just would encourage you that get the whole album because you begin to see things, feel things. For example, you have on your last track on that album, a Groovy Sex album, George on my mind. Yeah. Now I was surprised to hear a vocal on that, not from you, but an amazing female vocalist. I'm like, whoa, I love the rendition on this, and that hasn't been talked about. So that's why I encourage people to get the whole album because there are some jewels in these albums that you'll be able to uncover and begin to enjoy. The George on my mind, I'm telling you, it, it caught me. It caught me in a good way. Yeah, it was kind of caught me off guard too. I got called for the session actually, and she is an artist out of Russia, as a matter of fact, town called Tbilisi. She and her husband were traveling in the U.S., and for some reason, she ended up in Katy, Texas, which is 20 minutes from me. The producer called me and said, hey, there's this vocalist here. We would absolutely love for you to come in and lay down some sax tracks on a few of her tunes. So that I did, and all of a sudden, I ended up playing on Georgia On My Mind, which was actually on her project, but my record label kind of fell in love with it, and it's like, okay, well, let's put this one out there so that that was basically the the second single off of the the groovy sax cd got it okay now how can people get in touch with you they want to connect with you online everyone a lot of people on social media where can they find you yeah i'm all over social media facebook twitter instagram or you can go to my website which is deanjamesjazz.com deanjamesjazz.com and has all your social media links right there too yeah you can you can find everything there Makes it real super simple, deanjamesjazz.com. Let's do this. That We're coming up to uh, on the end of our segment. Introduce us to any one of your tracks. Give us some little history on that, whatever you can give. You know, talk to us a little bit about it, you know, and uh, let's get into that one because I want people to hear your music. What do you have for us? Okay. Well, one of my favorites is It's All Good. And I sat on that for a while and and writing the background music and the melody line, I just sat on it because I, I didn't think it would be ready. So I literally sat on that for two years. But someone t- someone told me after they listened to the rough mixes, I hadn't been mastered yet. The line was, everyone would say, man, it sounds great. It's, it's all good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like, well, it's the message I got was, hey, basically, it's, it's ready, man. You're just being too critical about it, and it sounds great. I went on ahead, and that became the third single from the Groovy Sax CD. Nice. And you're listening to it right here on Sacramento Smooth Jazz. Dean, I really am thankful that you joined us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for having me.
Thanks for listening to Sacramento Smooth Jazz. To continue listening to Smooth Jazz 24-7, follow Sac Smooth Jazz on social media and listen by going to sacsmoothjazz.fm. <laughs>